administrator from Healthy Seminars. And today we have a lecture that is a sponsored talk as part of the 2021 Integrated Fertility Symposium. And we also brought in not just those that registered for IFS 2021, but our whole community. And so we're including this as part of our community unity immunity lecture series as well. Our topic is Chaseberry, Maca, and Ashwagandha for supporting fertility, scientific and TCM perspectives. And we have a really cool dynamic duo here, dual here. Um, we have Benjamin Zappen, who is um, a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist and co-founder of Five Flavor Herbs. And we have Ingrid Bauer, who is a medical doctor, um, who's also part of the Five Flavor Herbs uh, family. So we want to, again, thank our sponsors, Five Flavor Herbs. And uh, we're going to get this lecture started in a moment. I just want to share um, a few things um, for you guys and uh, what you can do and expect during our, our lecture. So... Um, Again, this is a sponsored talk on IFS. Um, and if you're looking to watch this lecture or the recordings, um, they are going to be on the IFS uh, symposium website. That's ifs.healthyseminars.com, at least until the end of August of 2021. And um, you can check out, they also have the Conceivable Pro line. And that's significant because we had a lecture by um, Kirsten Karchmer um, on mastering um, women's health, the only six formulas you need and how to use them. And so if you miss that lecture, it's available here still, that recording on the website. It's also on the Healthy Seminars um, website. It's also on the Five Flavor Herbs also can make that available to you as well. Um, and then we did a Q&A, a live Q&A with Kirsten. And so that's available too. So if you, I really recommend if you're treating women's health and you want to use um, herbal, Chinese herbal medicine, um, then Kirsten's put together an excellent lecture and they have a special offer on that line that Kirsten Karchmer helped develop. So do check out this um, page on the IFS website to find out about their discount that's good until the end of August. And then we have our lecture today, um, and we'll put the Q&A up here as well. You're going to be part of it as for those here live. And again, that's on Chaseberry, Maca, Ashwagandha for supporting fertility, the scientific and TCM perspective. If you want handouts from the past lecture, and this lecture, so the one by Kirsten Karchmer or this one by Benjamin and Ingrid, do contact Five Flavor Herbs directly. They are more than happy to provide you um, with the handouts from both of these lectures um, if you are interested in that. I do want to let you know um, that this is for educational purposes only. So this is not intended to be medical advice. This should not be perceived as medical advice because this is for continued education purposes only. If you have a healthcare health condition, please seek out a medical um, healthcare provider. And then um, I want to let you know that we have the community library. So this is where we'll put these lectures up as well. So you can see the one by Five Flavors is there. So there's many ways you can find um, these past lectures. And so the one by Five Flavor Herbs, they'll go to our library. As I mentioned earlier, um, they're also available um, on our webs uh, on our Healthy Seminars Facebook page and YouTube page, so you can continue finding them there to watch those as well. Um, we definitely want you to be able to have access to those, so we have it in a couple of places for you to do it. And then always, as our community unity immunity lectures, um, I do just want to remind you that you check out the resource page, um, and you can find out what we have available and what's coming up um, during the coming weeks. All right, so I'm gonna stop my share here. And um, also on the IFS website, for those that are part of the IFS, um, if you go into the forums, there is a place where our, our sponsors like Five Flavor Herbs have put together some generous um, packages for you guys where you can save. So do check out on that on the IFS website, that's ifs.healthyseminars.com. And for anybody that's watching this lecture, do contact Five Flavor Herbs directly if you're interested in the handouts from these past lectures that they have sponsored. And you can ask them if they have any specials as well. All right, let's bring up the recording. Um, do post your questions in the chat room. We're gonna collect those. And then at the end of this talk, which is about 37 minutes, um, I have with us live, um, Benjamin and Ingrid, and they're going to respond to your questions. So please do um, post your questions as they come to your attention. Benjamin Zeppin. Hi, I'm Ingrid Bauer. And we're from Five Flavors Herbs, and we're really excited to present at the International Fertility Symposium. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for having us. Great. 
Today we're going to do a presentation talking about three uh, key herbs for supporting fertility goals uh, and we'll be sharing both our scientific as well as traditional Chinese medicine perspectives on these key herbs, which is chase tree berry, maca, and ashwagandha. Uh, we've been really excited to present about these because they've been part of our clinical practice for over 20 years and have seen their benefits. And uh, we've recently done a deep dive into the available research and uh, want to present to you our corroboration of that research with perspectives on how to include them in a TCM fertility practice. At Five Flavors Herbs, we uh, make and dispense herbal extracts to both the general public as well as to a broad range of health practitioners, acupuncturists, naturopathic doctors, um, integrative medicine doctors, and um, also uh, collaborate with Conceivable on a line of fertility products based in traditional Chinese medicine formulas. So we'll be sharing more about those offerings through the uh, International Fertility Symposium and during this presentation, we will uh, really be focusing on clinical and not trying to sell you products. So we hope you learn a lot and um, we'll see you around the symposium as it uh, proceeds. So, you know, as a TCM practitioner, uh, there's a variety of reasons to, and I'm a licensed acupuncturist myself, uh, reasons to study non-TCM herbs. So to develop informed perspectives on things your patients may already be taking or are asking you about. Uh, we in the fertility community have a very smart and informed patient population who are often come to us with a very high level of expertise and a lot of information and intelligent questions about that uh, they may already be taking. Um, and I think that being able to not just say, well, this isn't TCM or this isn't part of the functional medicine that I study, but I should be able to say, uh, how do they fit in with our model? Uh, can enable us to you know, potentially have better therapeutic outcomes than with TCM alone. Uh, and so that you know, addresses understanding the compatibility with existing treatment plans. And research-backed therapies may be more appropriate for some conditions or patients uh, for practical or ethical reasons. Uh, an ethical reason may be the patient's preference. I still have patients come to me and say, I don't want to take Chinese herbs. I'm, I have an aversion to you know, a belief that there's something dirty about them. You know, that they're you know, maybe more susceptible to contamination or be concerned about the carbon footprint. So uh, people may want to take bioregional you know, grown in, uh, grown in the United States herbs, which uh, is possible for Vitex and ashwagandha, less so for maca. Uh, and they may have, to, have possessed the potential to enhance TCM treatments, and I'll share my convictions about some of that. I say a lot of the same things to fellow uh, Western medicine trained physicians uh, when they say, well, why should I study herbs at all? So I think everything Ben said uh, for people who practice traditional Chinese medicine, people trained in acupuncture and herbal medicine, I would also say the same, many of the same things to my physician colleagues who are uh, hesitant to learn about herbs because their patients are using them and they shouldn't know about them so that they can give sound advice. Uh, so, from a TCM perspective, maca root, the Pidium myonii, is sweet, bitter, slightly warm, it enters the heart, liver, kidney. How do we know? Uh, it's a much longer conversation. Uh, this is an assessment by myself and uh, my colleague and good friend Thomas Avery Guerin, uh, looking at the actions is how we lend uh, credibility to the flavor and chi uh, flavor depicting the actions on the body sweet supplements, bitter drains uh, and clears, usually clears heat, uh, channels entered, is informed by the terrain of the body and the internal organs as we understand them from a traditional Chinese medical pr uh, perspective. So maca supplements chi, blood, yin and yang, boosts the intelligence, sedates hyperactive yang due to yin shu, and boost the jing will refer to these 
throughout our observations of the uh, available literature. So, uh, you know, some of the most reputable things that were the, the most commonplace things that maca has been promoted as a superfood and, uh, you know, and in s to some degrees an adaptogen, but the available research goes much deeper um, than simply being a uh, adaptogenic aphrodisiac. So uh, there's a lot of ways that maca has been applied, both traditionally and contemporary. Um, it's being used in supporting uh, female reproductive health, especially for fertility goals, um, as well as for um, overall sexual function and desire, especially perimenopausal women, um, supporting prevention of osteoporosis. Um, also alleviating anxiety and depression, um, something that can uh, help boost the mood while also create a cap. Um, uh, there is searchable share on supporting the sperm count and also um, some benefits for BPH as well. Um, male sexual function and then low energy, poor memory uh, are other applications. Of their yeah, so in consideration of inclusion in a TCM practice, we want to look at the intersection of traditional applications, you know, and so we'll examine the available ethnobotanical literature and also look at research models. So some of the chemical constituents of maca, um, many of them are water soluble. The glucosinolates are water soluble compounds that are actually pretty common to all brassicas. And um, Within the root, there's also lipids, macamides, and macaines. These are actually the unique marker compounds. So when there is going to be a scientific study or some extract, it will often be the compound that uh, a product is standardized to and also used for identity verification. For example, a powder in commerce. It can be run through a machine and identified, oh, yep, that white sort of chalky, sweet, tasty powder is maca root, not something else. And there's also alkaloids, there's some bitter flavor going on there too. Um, so in terms of mechanisms that are well understand, uh, well understood, one of the really interesting um, effects of macamide is that it seems to inhibit anandamide degradation. So for those of you who have studied the endocannabinoid system, you remember that anandamide is one of our own body's endogenous endocannabinoids. And by blocking the degradation, you can boost the levels uh, increase their duration in the body and really boost the mood. Um, so to me, that's that's really exciting in terms of the overlap between different body systems. Um, there's also some evidence that uh, compounds of maca root promote lady cell proliferation and testosterone production, as well as, you know, this is in the brassica family. We know that there's a lot of antioxidant activity in broccoli. Broccoli sprouts are a really popular supplement right now, and I like to eat it out of my garden. Um, the antioxidant activity, both of the macamide lipid component as well as the glucinolates, may improve sperm health and likely contribute to some of the cognitive and mood benefits also in maca root. Uh, when we <clears throat> take a look at ashwagandha, we'll see that this is a common denominator that the antioxidant activity uh, improving sperm health outcomes is a you know, it's a common factor. Uh, other layers of evidence base. A small human trial showed improved seminal volume, sperm count, and mobility, sperm count and mobility without changing hormone levels in men. Uh, the implication being it may not change behavior or it may not increase risk factors for hormonally driven cancers uh, or, or demonstrate other um, body-related changes uh, related to uh, testosterone increase. Male sexual performance. After eight weeks, there was a statistically significant increase in male sexual desire in men treated with maca root extract. Uh, I think this is important when these trials that do have duration included and um, this is another way that looking at evidence can help us inform a therapeutic treatment planning with our patients. It's easy to uh, give people herbs and supplements and have your patients say, well, how long should I take this? And not have an answer. And 
uh, you know, I, I see the fertility community be really being really exceptional in providing guidance and guidelines. Uh, but I do also see that being something that students are often not trained well in in Chinese medicine. So having an eight week parameter, uh, you know, as a guideline for your patients can be really helpful. Uh, the other thing that I like to do with my patients is encourage them to pay attention uh, and encourage them to you know, track, make notes, uh, you know, hopefully be sharing this with the partner so they're increasing their mutual desire and satisfaction. Uh, my experience with maca is you don't have to wait eight weeks to experience some boosted energy, experiencing some increased sexual desire and performance. So uh, enhancing ovulation, a rat study showed enhanced pre-estrous LH levels in female rats fed maca root powder, suggesting benefit in improving ovulatory function. So this is the main piece of evidence available as a rat study, not human trials uh, for its ability to uh, support women in fertility goals. Uh, some of the other layers of documentation are uh, th this grows at a very high elevation and uh, you know a very rugged environment in which humans are challenged and this is a primary food an important contrast to clinical evidence is that the dosages recommended are often relatively small they're often a gram taken, you know, a gram or two taken two or three times a day, whereas people may eat up to 50 to 100 grams a day during peak seasons. Right, so you can see that there's something there. I would also say that there's a lot of research about maca that we didn't include because we're focusing on fertility outcomes. In terms of uh, research in women with maca root, a lot of the research has been focused on peri perimenopausal mood symptoms and sexual symptoms. And that's where you find a lot of rich data on uh, human clinical trials. So it's uh, definitely being researched in that area and hasn't gotten so much into um, not as much human data on um, women population. Um, but um, again, we, we talked a little bit about standard dosing in the market and what's being used clinically. Um, very rare to have adverse effects, again, because it has a history of being a food plant. So we think of it as pretty, pretty darn safe. Um, because there, we think that there's very low likelihood of having any impact on hormone responsive cancers in part because these studies have shown that there actually isn't a significantly detectable change in serum hormone levels. Um, but because of the unknown, probably best to just avoid in um, individuals with a strong personal or family history of hormone responsive cancers of the reproductive system. Um, and probably best to avoid in, in, during pregnancy itself. That being said, many people are taking supplements to support pregnancy uh, or con conception and figure out six or eight weeks into a pregnancy. And most times things turn out just fine. That being said, it's probably not something to just pick up and start taking while pregnant. Um, uh, some of that antioxidant activity, and we'll see this in a lot of, uh, a lot of herbs, uh, is that maca root, similar to ashwagandha we'll talk about, has benefits for the cardiovascular and metabolic systems and may actually reduce blood pressure and blood sugar. And so for individuals who are taking medications, I just keep an eye out for additive effects. Uh, make sure folks are monitoring their blood pressure, monitoring their blood sugar. If you notice a decrease, that could be great. Maybe they don't need to take the, uh, the higher doses that they were on before, uh, but it's just something to keep an eye on and pay attention to. So to combine with TCM formulas, uh, we won't belabor all these, but this is uh, something for you to go. We'll, we'll share these notes. We'll make these available. Um, come, come to our sponsor page, and uh, you can you can take these. But um, some ideas, just to name a couple of these: Arshian Tang, being uh, a formula that supplements the yin and the yang of the body, is commonly prescribed in commonly prescribed during menopause and is supportive for uh, yang supplementation, yin supplementation. I think this is a good fit to combine with that, possibly a good fit to combine with that in an attempt to reduce blood sugar instabilities and reduce uh, blood pressure 
challenges that perimenopausal women may be having. Uh, combining it with chai hu based formulas, you know, it's such a common staple to use chai hu based formulas for phase two of the menstrual cycle, sinusan, uh, chai hu guajir ganjan, chai hu guajir tan, jia uh, wei shai you know, depending on the presentation or the style of traditional Chinese medicine that you're practicing. Uh, so th this can be a time uh, where you know there's less of an emphasis or focus on uh, specific fertility outcomes, but uh, it's still you know with all these formulas there is a supplementation component, and if uh, maca is a good fit for your clients, uh, they may enjoy taking it. But I see many many humans, male and female, uh, really enjoy taking it consistently. Great. Moving forward, okay. we have about a half hour. So chase tree berry or Vitex agnus cassis uh, is acrid, bitter, and neutral. Uh, channels entered are the liver and heart. The main action, it regulates hormone balance. It's a very dynamic herb. Uh, it is related botanically to manjinza, uh, but its actions are very different. It courses the liver and rectifies chi, uh, is useful for menstrual block and pain, PMS breast swelling, menstrual irregularities, ovulatory pain, and other PMS symptoms. Uh, it moves chi, frees depression, and opens the network vessels. For stopping or decrease in lactation due to liver depression, chi stagnation, with distension and fullness of the breast, anger, irritability, string-like pulse, and thin tongue fur. This is taken directly from Thomas Avery Guerin's Using Western Herbs in Traditional Chinese Medicine text, his first volume of that. And so, and, you know, it's particularly well organized in the Nigel Weissman uh, translation language. So some traditional and contemporary applications coming from how um, chase tree berry is being used in the herbal products marketplace and clinically in the West, um, most predominantly as a hormonal regulator. And the question comes up a lot of trying to get into the nitty gritty of does it increase LH, does it increase progesterone, what is it actually doing to the hormones? And it's a little bit unclear from my one review of the literature and also seeing how it works in practice, which is as an amphoteric herb. The definition of amphoteric is an herb that helps regulate the normal function of a body system. And so we see this in chase tree berry where it can help regulate heavy menses and light menses. It can help bring short cycles to a fuller length or longer cycles to a shorter length. It can help address spotting in the, the middle of the cycle. And there are many hormonal processes that are happening in each individual person, but we see Vitex be a benefit in a broad range, especially to bring the menses back into a sort of regular predictable cycle where you kind of know when you're ovulating, which is obviously very helpful in fertility outcomes. And you can anticipate when you're gonna menstruate and then it has these um, benefits for addressing some of the symptoms associated with PMS. It can make that cycle uncomfortable. Um, there's also a bunch of research on Vitex in easing perimenopausal symptoms um, and a history of it being used as a galactagog, although some current rec uh, references recommend against using it in breastfeeding. We'll talk about some of the pharmacology of that, why. So constituents of chase tree berry um, flavonoids are a big part of this um, and um, are iridoid glycosides. Um, there's also a number of essential oils. It's very pungent. Um, it also lasts for a very long time. If you grow a plant, it's incredibly fragrant and then the berries themselves almost have a peppery type flavor. Um, so those essential oils um, also likely pay a really important role. Um, mechanisms of action. So one of the things that chase tree berry does is that it has some central dopamine activity and actually blocks prolactin release. And this is mechanistically why current researchers recommend against using it in breastfeeding. There's a hypothetical chance that you could shut down 
uh, prolactin. That being said, it's more often utilized in a, a herbal context when uh, somebody is having high prolactin levels and outside of the context of breastfeeding. Um, and then uh, we think it may decrease estrogen and increase progesterone vis-a-vis -vis, uh, hypothalamic pituitary processes. But again, when it's inhibiting and when it's stimulating, it's a little bit unclear. Uh, PMS and uh, pre, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, there's research in its effectiveness for management and treatment of physical and emotional symptoms of PMS. It's performed, it's performed comparable to fluoxetine or Prozac in one study for PMDD. And I have a lot of experience using this in women who experience extreme states of consciousness, uh, do some uh, critical mental health support, and uh, it's very common for women on mood, more, more substantial than antidepressant mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, uh, to have more profound expressions of their extreme states of consciousness, bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, and uh, using Vitex, especially in phase two of the menstrual cycle, can really help alleviate that and enable people to be on stable psychiatric treatment plans. So I use this as an adjunct uh, with other psychiatric medication that has also helped me see just how powerful it is as a single herb uh, for the subjective. Cyclical breast discomfort may be effective for patients with cyclical breast discomfort. Uh, and I think it's, it's obvious how we'll combine that with Chinese herbs. Uh, in terms of infertility, uh, the, these are meta-analysis uh, studies that you can go look up. There's limited evidence for efficacy as a standalone treatment for infertility. Uh, when I read that, I think that's just fine. I understand how to use chase tree berry for fertility in conjunction with good Chinese medical practice, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so one of the things we didn't talk about in terms of traditional uses of Vitex, but it has a tradition of um, chaste uh, tree, uh, indicating that it there's sort of folklore around it being used for monks in Europe to reduce their sexual desire. And it looks like with one of the other Vitex species, so Vitex Mugundo, has been studied to actually decrease sperm volume, motility, and induce organ atrophy. That being said, we haven't seen... Um, Chase tree berry being an effective necessary tool for as an anti uh, fertility agent, and um, um, but at least traditionally it's sort of no thought of as not something that's a great for a guy's libido. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have seen it have an unfavorable result in women's libido, so that's something to be mindful of. Uh, it's not in common practice. You know, so I think that uh, scenarios in which I thought it would be indicated are uh, young men, maybe young men who are conserved, who, you know, due to mental health concerns, um, just a population I've worked with a lot, who through uh, puberty become more aggressive mm -hmm. is uh, a potential application of this. And I know that it's uh, increasingly being used in the trans community for male to female uh, transitioning for this very application and thus substantiated by research. So um, typical dosing for chase tree berry includes uh, one to three grams twice daily is either a powder or a capsule um, or one to four milliliters, meaning one to four dropper folds of tincture, one to three times daily, um, depending on the context and severity of symptoms. Um, we talked about some of these potential adverse effects. Contraindications, we think probably best to avoid in pregnancy. And then there's this question uh, of caution in breastfeeding. I would say if somebody is having a difficult time breastfeeding, um, this might not be my go-to galactic dog. We have many other tools, both in the traditional Chinese formula toolkit and Western herbal toolkit, as well as great you know, lactation consultants uh, at hand to help with that. So maybe best to stick away from it. Um, in terms of uh, herb-drug interactions, there is a theoretical risk with dopamine agonists um, because of the additive effect. 
or dopamine receptor blocking agonists. So caution in individuals that are either taking antipsychotics, which are dopamine blocking, or are taking um, medications for Parkinson's disease, which um, agonizes or turns on the dopamine system. So those are things to just be wary of um, and may not come up in populations that you're working on with fertility goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the in the literature I read, they, they critique the concern regarding Parkinson's because most women who are experiencing treatment for Parkinson's are postmenopausal. Yeah. So probably not going to be used. So yeah. So you know, Kirsten Karchmer, who is the founder and developer of Conceivable Proline, which we now own and operate, uh, which is a really amazing community, uh, and we're honored to be part of that. She, when I brought that recently, uh, Vitex, she said, oh, I hate Vitex because uh, there's a potential for it to be, uh, you know, uh, bring false hope in reorganizing the menstrual cycle. And I respectfully hear her critique of that, um, you know, because it can support a woman, regulate her cycle, and then think everything's okay uh, without being mindful and aware of the underlying set of deficiencies or uh, blockages that need to be regulated. So I think that it can be very important if somebody comes to you and says, I'm already taking Vitex and my cycle is so well organized, it's amazing. Because it will do that. Uh, you know, I've treated women who said I haven't had a regular menstrual cycle in 15 years and they start taking Vitex and start having 30 day cycles. It's that, it's that mind bendingly uh, functional. What you need to do in your interrogation and your questioning is say, well, what was going on before this and include that in your clinical picture uh, upon which, and you're, you're gonna see other signs and symptoms that you know, you're gonna corroborate to create your therapeutic treatment planning with traditional Chinese herbs. Uh, you know, and I, I list these formulas in part because uh, they're, they're some of the top players that, one, I combine this with for not just fertility goals, but, you know, more significant irregular bleeding, fibroids, uh, endometriosis, uh, the mental health concerns that we talked about, uh, and just re regulation of humans. Uh, so... Uh, I think it's a really powerful player, and I've been working with it in collaboration with Chinese formulas for 20 years. All right, moving along. That's uh, term. Ashwagandha root is from the Ayurvedic tradition. It's very common in the American marketplace, billed as an, an adaptogen. Uh, it is sweet, bitter, warm, supplements the kidney, liver, and heart. Very similar to maca, I think, in many ways, although maca is in the brassica family, and this is in the uh, uh, Solanaceae, you know, uh, or the you know potato tomato family. Supplements chi, blood, yin and yang. Supplements liver yin and benefit sleep, and boosts the jing. Ashwagandha is really a pretty amazing uh, medicinal toolkit in and of itself, um, and uh, is. I would probably also call it amphoteric in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, helping bring the body into balance. It uh, simultaneously can help with anxiety and uh, athletic performance, balancing blood sugar, um, and then has a really long-standing reputation as both an aphrodisiac and is a sexual topic. There's also a lot of research on immune supporting and anti, obviously, um, in infection and um, looking into areas around cancer prevention, as well as anti-aging and memory enhancing, so for cognitive um, performance and uh, prevention of degenerative uh, brain disease. So uh, many active constituents, some of them are steroidolactones. Withanilide and withiparin are often standardized too and used as markers. Um, there are alkalides, uh, alkaloids, as are in many of the uh, plants in this family. Um, but contrary to proper belief, there's actually no nicotine 
Um, I think that used to be sort of part of folklore around ashwagandha. Um, there's also some acids, amino acids, saponine, et cetera. So all of these different compounds combine uh, to have a complex mechanism of action. Talks about anti-inflammatory. Um, so there's some aspects of pain relief um, uh, that can also are seen in some of the traditional uses for arthritis and rheumatism. There's antioxidant, hepatoprotective, and anti-cancer activity. There's also immunomodulatory and blood building or hematopoietic activity. And there are uh, tranquilizing benefits for the central nervous system and cardiovascular system. Uh, for sexual function in women, a study of 50 healthy women demonstrated that 300 milligrams of a concentrated ashwagandha extract, uh, different than taking the bulk herb, improved sexual arousal, lubrication, orgasmic frequency, and satisfaction. The management of male infertility is a review that indicates ashwagandha improves sperm motility and volume, inhibits lipid peroxidation via its antioxidative mechanisms, and regulates reproductive hormone levels. Uh, now, ashwagandha, uh, similar to maca, is something that you know we'll see in the studies that taking over a period of time uh, promotes certain reproductive goals. But the other thing that people enjoy and appreciate about it, which is also a critique of uh, many TCM formulas and strategies, is uh, the critique is that people don't feel many Chinese strategies right away, mm -hmm. um, and especially the kind of gentler delivery systems that people prefer in the West. And taking ashwagandha as a tea, you know, for instance, as a as a powder simmered in some milk, people people feel the calmative, relaxing, and sexual rejuvenative benefits of this. Similarly, taking the tincture one to three mil of the tincture three times a day. Uh, people experience that vitalization fairly efficiently. The tincture makes a really nice nightcap. We brew some in our greenhouse and made our own tincture that we've been nipping at as a little uh, little nip in the evening. And it's just sweet and delicious and both uplifting as well as calming. It's a really nice combination to just feel directly in the body. So it's a good one to, to use yourself and get a handle on how it feels. Mm -hmm. uh, um, drowsiness. It's not something that's just going to knock you out when you're sitting there, but obviously combining with other herbs or medications, uh, sometimes to think about. Um, again, because of the plant family it's in, some people experience some GI upset. So dosing and figuring out how to take it either with or without food um, can be uh, important. Probably best to avoid in pregnancy and um, similar to maca, avoiding in hormone sensitive cancers. Um, as well as uh, avoiding a hyperthyroid. I didn't mention this in some of the traditional applications um, and research, but there is some evidence that ashwagandha stimulate TSH um, and upregulate thyroid hormone production in terms of T4. So um, that would be hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease as a place or active Hashimoto's thyroiditis I would avoid. Um, and then also because of its immunostimulant properties, avoiding people taking immunosuppressants either for autoimmune diseases or transplant rejection medications. So here's, here's another list of TCM formulas that you may combine this with uh, for supplementation. Supplementation in particular, notice the inclusion of some spirit calming, liver blood building formulas, Erger one, uh, Swan Sao Rin Tang for uh, supplementation of liver blood with the objective of calming the mind and providing a restful sleep. Uh, like Swan Sao Rin Tang, it's not a little pill for sleep. That is ashwagandha is not mm -hmm. a little pill for sleep. Uh, it is something that you take on a regular basis to supplement your nervous system. Uh, I'll very commonly, especially perimenopausal women, um, or in the typical picture of somebody who may come to see me for fertility support is very commonly a stressed out professional who waited until their late thirties or early forties to try to get pregnant and often very type A and needing in need of a lot of supplementation, but also winding down the mind uh, will commonly, you know, for, uh, you know, very commonly for phase one, I'll combine say Wen Jing Tang with Swan Tsai Ren Tang and some ashwagandha, maybe in a separate delivery system. You know, that's a common pairing. Uh, referencing Arjun, Arshian Tang here again. Uh, 
but also the inclusion of Jingwei Shenqi uh, and Zorgui Wan as uh, kidney on uh, formulas to add, add a little something extra to boost the Jing to those. Those are, those are some considerations. Our bibliographies in here come, uh, stick around, there's going to be a Q&A after this, uh, and we'll make this uh, presentation available for you to see. Um, meet up with us, create an opportunity to meet up with us for some networking during the symposium. And thanks again, Lauren, and I look forward to meeting Nick. Thanks a lot, everyone. All right, I want to thank both Benjamin and Ingrid for putting together this um, this lecture. And again, for those that are new to both Benjamin and Ingrid, um, to let you know, um, Benjamin is a licensed acupuncturist herbalist and Ingrid is a medical doctor. So it's really nice to have that integration from the presentation side. And they're also, we have um, our founders here, co-founders of Five Flavor Herbs. And so being able to offer both a Chinese um, herbal approach as well as the functional medicine approach. If you check out their um, sponsor page, ifs.healthyseminars.com, um, we'll have that up until the end of August. You can see some of the products and services they offer and they do have some specials. So they have a whole fertility line um, that um, you can save on now. And so do check out the page. Kirsten's lecture is up there so you can watch her lecture plus the Q&A. And then we have, if you want to rewatch any parts of the lecture, it's on this page and we'll have the Q&A up shortly as well. And then do go visit their, their webpage. Um, so go, go to the Five Flavor, Five Flavor Herbs website if you want handouts to these lectures because they said they'd be happy to um, share that. If you're part of the IFS, go to the special offers page on the forum. So go to forums and go to special offers. And you can see the sponsors here, and I'm talking today about Fairhaven. They've listed some special deals for you guys that you can um, take advantage of. So, um, and there, and there's our, our presenters. So uh, nice to see you, Benjamin and Ingrid. So let's go through a few um, questions and comments here. Um, one of the questions was how might um, MAC interfere with testosterone blood tests? So if somebody's taking MAC, uh, would this show up potentially on a uh, serum to talk testosterone test? Hypothetically, possibly. However, it, that it's listed in the literature as a possibility. Um, I think the likelihood is very, very low at the typical dosing that people are taking as a supplement. Thank you. Um, and then do you have suggestions for um, the, what you like to recommend since you're both practitioners? Um, from your herbal arsenal for depression and difficulty sleeping and just emotional imbalance, um, whether it's related or not to infertility? Well, you know, one, one answer to that is, you know, I rely on Chinese differential diagnosis. And for, you know, one person that's going to be a bupleurin based formula. And for one person that's going to be a uh, foodza based formula. And you know, foods, you know, foods and Renchen, you know, maybe the, the key to supplementation and really giving somebody enough energy that they feel emotionally stable. Um, you know, I've seen, seen that many times. So you've also given me foods and I turned into like a raving lunatic and we know that that's I'm, not, a I'm good not saying that's for everybody. Exactly. So again, um, that's a pattern differentiation and very unique to each individual. Yeah. Um, so you know, if you could be more specific with what type of emotional instability that could be helpful to give a more specific answer. I like um, your, I like I, how you started though, as you got to do a diagnosis, like what's the underlying cause here? Yeah. You know, rather as, than just, as, as far as sleep goes, um, you know, and here I'll, I'll plug our company and plug Western herbs a little bit. Uh, I find that tincture as a delivery system for calmatives, and things that are sedative uh, is a really powerful delivery system. And I've gravitated to many herbs on the um, Western herbal repertoire that I think work more efficiently than many Chinese formulas. And that's why we've combined a lot of the Western herbs we have with Chinese formulas to create something that gets that result more quickly to be a sleep aid. Yeah, so as I mentioned in the lecture, Swanzao Rintang is not a little sleeping pill. 
but if you add some uh, California poppy and um, chamomile to it, it's going to help accelerate the rate at which somebody falls asleep. Um, there is a comment actually in the chart also asking about ashwagandha related to sleep and adverse uh, reactions, whereas, you know, a certain percentage of individuals will respond. And again, I think that's going back to using, you know, constitutional differential diagnosis and or trial, trial and error, because you might think, oh, this person fits this pattern perfectly and you give them something and it doesn't always have the intended effect. Um, and that goes with pharmaceuticals as well, because that's often, you know, that's the realm that I'm often interacting in as well. Um, but I think that ashwagandha for the vast majority of people can be a phenomenal remedy for sleep, but it's not soporific. It doesn't necessarily make you sleepy, um, but for people that are so exhausted, similar to the pattern of the swans I run tongue, they're so exhausted that they're not sleeping well, it can be an incredibly effective adjunctive and to use it routinely either as part of a bedtime ritual or even multiple times through the day can be supportive with people that are having insomnia due to over pensation um, and that sort of stress exhaustion that also comes with the past year and a half of many of our lives. What about with the ashwagandha setting expectations for patients? And in this case, somebody who's been diagnosed with a thyroid condition. So you're using ashwagandha. When would you expect them those markers to shift so they can recommend to their patients when to um, have that retested? I, I often go with when does somebody have a, a, a qualitative experience, a somatic experience that they have more energy and vitality. And I'm usually not gonna be offering ashwagandha as a standalone therapeutic treatment plan you know, so we're going to probably be using micronutrients, probably use a TCM formula and use ashwagandha rather than use ashwagandha as a little pill to support the thyroid. Uh, and so my, before I send somebody to the lab to see if it's working, hopefully they're going to be getting qualitative feedback themselves and give it to me. And, uh, you know, before we say, maybe it's time to adjust your thyroid. I would also say from the sort of Western medical standpoint, um, whenever I'm making a dose adjustment of thyroid hormone replacement, whether it's with a natural or a synthetic thyroid replacement, I mean, if I'm making a dose adjustment, I'm usually waiting eight to 12 weeks um, before rechecking labs. I also would not rely on ashwagandha um, to treat uh, hypothyroidism. And I actually don't rely on herbs to treat thyroid conditions exclusively anyways, because it's a very delicate area. Um, there are many skilled herbalists and practitioners who are working in that realm, but it's not my expertise to necessarily treat thyroid conditions exclusively with herbs. But I think being aware of the potential effects on thyroid hormone levels and thyroid health if people are on medications or have a diagnosed hypo or hyperthyroid condition, being aware of the potential impact, which is probably minimal um, at best uh, for herbs like ashwagandha or lemon balm, which are probably the two most common and or using seaweed products. Those are places to just be aware and then if, if somebody has had fluctuations or is having symptoms to make sure that they're in touch with their primary or whoever's ordering those labs to do it as appropriate. And you're using maca for reproductive health and, and hormonal health. Do you have a type um, that you like to use, white, yellow, red, black um, in your practices? What do you guys carry? Um, we do not differentiate and I know that there is research on that. When you go into the research, those differentiations are made. Um, our suppliers that we have access to maca through are not differentiating that. There's only one brand importing it into the US that uh, does have those distinctions made in their quality control and manufacturing. I forget the name of the brand. Um, I've used them, I like their products, uh, but we don't have access to that type of differentiation on our, our supply chain. And it is the same genus and species. So the coloration is a, is an incidental um, random popping up of the root of this radish plant, radish family plant um, of weather. So it's not like they're different strains that have necessarily been selected. 
which is also why some of the more special colors um, gain more sort of importance and uh, particularities in part because they're less commonly uh, showing just in on the farm where they're being grown. What about um, how with the Westerners like ashwagandha or Vitex, do you adjust based on where they are in the cycle? Because I think in your um, Chinese herbal line for reproductive health, the conceivable line that Kirsten's done, mm -hmm. that sometimes that will change based on where you are in the cycle. Do you do that um, with your Western as well? So Vitex, is it throughout the cycle or does it change? Ashwagandha, do you change whether it's follicular or luteal? Yeah. Uh, with ashwagandha, I will be more careful in phase two in the premenstrual phase um, and be cautious and may omit that if it seems to be exacerbating PMS. That said, I don't see that that often. Um, so, you know, that, that is somebody I will give it in a separate delivery system so somebody can toggle on and off and see if it's creating a you know, a qualitative uh, experience of discomfort. Vitex, uh, it depends. If somebody already has a consistent, well-organized menstrual cycle, I may only give it in phase two uh, prior to, you know, if we're using it for PMS. We're using it for moving liver chi and, uh, you know, adjusting the mood um, that that's an appropriate use for it. If somebody has a disorganized menstrual cycle and we want to use it, you know, if, if it's long or if it's um, absent or if it is uh, irregular, erratic bleeding, uh, we might give this along with, um, you know, something supplementing in phase one and something regulating in phase two uh, to support getting the cycle back on track and as we discussed in that lecture you know it it puts the menstrual cycle on training wheels and you know I, there was a discourse about kirsten's critique of the herb it's you know it's menstrual cycle on training wheels and if you don't take the training wheels off now and again you never know if that person can really ride the bike and it might be uh, offering false hope so i might take you know have somebody take it for three months while they're doing supplementation they're doing chi regulation they're doing blood movement and then have them discontinue the vitex to uh, see where their cycle's at with the um the so our, our herbs today were chase tree and the vitex and the ashwagandha um do you use that in women that have been diagnosed with endometriosis is that something that's part of your herbal um, uh, regimen. Uh, similarly, ab absolutely. Um, and I see it be helpful. And if that's, um, I might use it with, I'll, I'll use a similar strategy. Uh, and um, if there's heavy menstrual bleeding, I might also use the Western herb shepherd's purse, which I've seen be really helpful in uh, endometriosis with bleeding outside the menstrual cycle. I've also seen it be very helpful in fibroids with bleeding outside of the menstrual cycle. And um, you know, we'll also use Vitex in such an incidence along with shepherd's purse to stop the bleeding. And then there's some in the conceivable line too that um, was developed um, for, you know, again, the pattern, but if there's pain and spotting and fertility that goes with that endometriosis diagnosis. There's some formulas I know that you guys have for that as well. So I'll, I'll give a shout out to check out that lecture and check out the information on five flavor herbs because they have much more educational content on using the conceivable line. Again, we got more questions, but just thought we saw a few questions coming through about the handouts. Um, go directly to Five Flavor Herbs website and contact them, and then they will be able to uh, send you those handouts. So go directly to the Five Flavor Herbs. We sent you to the IFS page because that's how you can link to the Five Flavor Herbs website, or you can just go directly to their site for those handouts. Um, what about um, somebody who's gone through an IVF? So the questions around herbal um, are, um, are your, the, from Five Flavor Herbs, do you have um, customers that are 
customers, practitioners that are um, using herbs um, in an IVF setting during the IVF and also um, in that early pregnancy, like post-transfer and those early pregnancy, especially I'm thinking um, from the question that we saw, somebody that's had recurrent pregnancy loss. So they've had a history of miscarriages. And so um, they're going to address the underlying imbalances, both acupuncture, diet, et cetera, including herbal. And so the question is, um, do you have suggestions of what you've seen in your clinical practice or what you see practitioners that are using your five flavor herbs uh, company yeah. treating women with miscarriage yeah. and doing IVF? You know, reach out to us directly about that and I can get some feedback from more experienced fertility focused practitioners. Uh, I've, I've supported many, many families in achieving their fertility goals as a TCM practitioner. Um, and 90 plus percent of the women who come to me who are doing IVF have been told not to do herbs and they agree that that's their preference. And I don't have enough experience personally to kind of overturn that or argue with their IVF, you know, their uh, reproductive endocrinologists. So it's not uncommon that I will refer to somebody who this is their focus. You know, if I can't support somebody in two or three months or if they're of advanced age, I might say, hey, you know, you're, you're better off working with Leslie Oldershaw, you know, who's two blocks away from our shop in Oakland. And, you're, you know, somebody with 20 years experience focused on fertility. And uh, so that's that's one one layer. But if you reach out to us directly, I can reach out to some of our practitioners and get an answer you know, we, we manufactured conceivable proline for six or seven years before taking it over. And um, the level of experience and, and focus that, you know, we've gotten to know a lot of our practitioners really well. They're really astounding. And we've ha been having some of them present for us and do round tables. So um, plug in, join our community. And, you know, we were intermittently having events uh, where you know you can engage with Kirsten Karchmer, the founder, uh, directly and do Q and A, and uh, very you know similar to this, we'll have a short presentation and some some roundtable conversation. It's really stimulating and it's really rewarding for us as the uh, people holding and carrying the leg Kirsten's legacy. So I will um, chime in on that question too, yeah, and, and again say. Thank you first to Benjamin and Ingrid for putting together this presentation. And like they said, join their community. So contact them. So if you have questions, um, I think that's one of the things that they've been proud of uh, talking to Benjamin and Ingrid on multiple times um, that they offer the support. So practitioners will will talk to them to look over case studies. So do 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 contact them. They'll make their handouts available for this lecture as well as the one that Kirsten Karchmer did. Check in with them about any specials they have for those that are part of the IFS. And um, the herbal one about herbal in IVF or herbal in pregnancy, um, you know, there are some REIs that say yes, say no, but really the question is not how you feel, not how you think does it work or not. Um, what's the data or the research say? And we're proud to say that during this IFS, we had a few talks. One of them was on um, recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, and um, our, our, pre our presenter is both a Chinese herbalist acupuncturist and a reproductive endocrinologist. They're both IVF doctors, so MD, OBGYN, IVF, yeah. and they did Chinese medicine. And they use herbs in their practice if anybody's had a history of implantation, implantation failure or, or miscarriage. And then um, Dr. Paul Magarelli, who's a reproductive endocrinologist, in his presentation, he actually shared data coming out of China and other parts of the world where they're showing certain formulas and using herbs in an IVF setting or in infertility cases, et cetera. Um, so um, it, the data is growing, is the point I'm making. The data is growing because the Western or conventional approach, approach usually is they need data. It's not what you think or want, or if you saw it, that doesn't really work from the Western perspective. It doesn't matter if you saw it, they need to reproduce it and make sure it's safe and reproducible and that takes time and money, I'll just share with you at the time of this recording, um, there's more and more data. Uh, maybe it's not great data, which, uh, which you call high level research, but at least something exists. 
and on the Fertility Now um, YouTube channel, which is part of the public educational page for IFS, but everybody can access it now on Fertility Now. We put up some of those presentations by Magarelli and the other doctors that talked about that. So that is available to you all. And then we went on that tangent to let you know that Five Flavor Herbs um, has a great um, herbal line that was um, um, created by um, Kirsten Karchmer. And, uh, and as Benjamin had mentioned, they were the manufacturer when it was um, run by Kirsten Karchmer and they've since <laughs> taken it over and they, they run it themselves as well. And they offer um, practitioner support. So take advantage of that. And if you want the handouts, um, then go contact Flavor Five Flavor Herbs. If you want to know what specials they have, go to the sponsor page or just contact them and ask them, is the IFS special available to you? Can we have it? <laughs> and they'll let you know if that time has expired or not. So uh, I basically what I'm saying is contact them, get the handouts, um, ask your questions and ask them about any specials um, they have. Did I miss anything, um, Benjamin or Ingrid, that you want to say before we kind of uh, close out our discussion today? Um, you know, I'll say thank you for having us. This has been really rewarding as a company and opportunity to connect with more practitioners. And it's been rewarding for me as a TCM practitioner to engage with your community and the educational forums that you put together. So really celebrate your contribution. Thank, thank you very much. And likewise, thank you for sponsoring the IFS and supporting us. We really appreciate that. I appreciate your shout out to uh, to science and uh, to making sure, I think with when we're talking about reproduction, I think it's great to sort of the mantra of like, we should have data that's reproducible if we're going to use it for reproductive health. Um, I think that's a great sort of correlation um, and not that uh, the only end all be all is the double blind placebo controlled trial, um, but that it is really important when we're talking about people's lives, health, um, them, you know, making decisions about bringing a family into the world that the more um, research on integrative practices that can be brought forward, I think the better we'll all be for it. I agree. And so let's let's keep the research going. I know Sandra's passionate about that and he's part of the evidence-based acupuncture group. And uh, like we said with the IFS, a lot of the most of the presentations had some research to support anything they were they were teaching. And those uh, some of the YouTube videos that were made for you to share with the public are available on Fertility Now. And again, a big thank you to Five Flavor Herbs um, for sponsoring this lecture. And again, check out their website to get the handouts um, for this presentation and the one that Kirsten Karchmer did as well. So thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks everybody. All right. Maybe next recording we'll stopped. Yeah. Yes. All right. I'm going to just share something because we people had some questions. So recording's off, but I just for those that are sticking around. And there's the five flavor herbs um, sponsor page on on IFS. So. You can check this out and then you can just link to their their page. Um, you know, it says there's all these places where you can learn, link more or you can go directly to the five flavor herbs. And then I just want to show you the um, some of these public education videos. So I just kind of want to call them to your attention. So I'm just going to go to public educational videos. This is the Fertility Now also on YouTube that you can go to. Um, so um, here's one where just to show you, because we're working off of now that Ingrid mentioned about that reproducible in the research. So here's an integrative clinic, mm -hmm. naturopathic physician that's inside an IVF clinic. And they looked at 10 years of their data, 10 years of, so every patient had an, was in an IVF setting, IUI or IVF, and they were working with a naturopath and acupuncturist. And they looked at 10 years data showing how much acupuncture improved IUIs. Um, so that was pretty cool. So there's that one. Um, this one's, I think, talking about PCOS, a medical doctor here. Um, Mike Armour, one of our colleagues from Chinese medicine, he shared his research on acupuncture. Um, I think this one, this one was not herbal. This one was acupuncture, Sandra, thumbs up, acupuncture research on um, endometriosis. Um, did better than the pain meds. So that's pretty cool because some of those pain meds have side effects. Um, we got Fiona McCulloch on PCOS. Um, here's Ruth. Um, Ealing, she's a, a IVF doctor um, and a TCM, and she talked about PCOS, integrated care. Mark Perlow is an IVF doctor, talked about why he loves integration. These are all public, um, and he's sharing research, right, about integration and treating um, PCOS, et cetera. These are all shareable. So these are short lectures 
by credible professionals that you can share with the public to inspire them to seek you out for, for their reproductive treatments. Um, another one here on PCOS, Paul Turk about uh, what men can do, Olivia Poye, um, Poye talking about men again in Chinese medicine. She's an MD, acupuncturist. Magarelli talking about integration. Um, uh, Lorena White's an IVF doctor and trained Chinese medicine acupuncture herbalist talking about integration. She uses herbs in her IVF clinic. She's an IVF doc. She's putting her patients on Chinese herbs, uh, most of them when they're doing IVF. This is the one I was mentioning, um, um, Dr. Ursula Ritz. She's an IVF doctor, trained Chinese medicine acupuncturist. And if they have uh, RPL or implantation failure, she usually wants them on herbal. She likes that over her heparin, her interleupids, all the Western stuff she has. It's the herbal that she anecdotally sees a lot of stuff. The Magarelli talk, I, I just want to go back to that one. Not this one, the public, but his IFS talk has a bunch of the research on Chinese herbs in an IVF setting and recurrent pregnancy loss. So you just may want to check those out. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know about that. If you go to YouTube and you search fertility now um, on the YouTube channel, um, um, if my face shows up in one of those, then you found it. And we have a whole bunch of those that are in the IFS group. Anybody can access those now and they're available for you to share on your website, on social media, again, with the goal to inspire people to seek you out for integrative care. Um, the IFS 2021 it's it was a it's closed now for registration you can access the courses so if you have questions about that i'm happy to show you that um, right now the registration closed we started in april it was supposed to end we started at sorry may it was supposed to end june 30th we extended and opened up registration for another two months and it ends august 31st however um let me just show you if you go to um the healthy seminars website this IFS 2021 plus some from the past years are available. So if you go to healthyseminars.com, you see where it says topics. If you go down and click on IFS and wait a second, it will list all IFS 21, 2021 talks and a few from previous years. So all those that were CEU approved are now available a la carte. Obviously, for those that purchased IFS, they got them at the best rate. Um, it was a group rate, but you can now buy them a la carte, and those are available um, on the healthyseminars.com website. If you register for the IFS, and you're asking this now, God help us all, because it, we're four months into it. You got like a week left, but you could go to the IFS website. You should log in, and your courses are all under uh, lectures or under dashboard, and that's where your 16 lectures that equal 36 hours they're all there or you can go to lectures but again you would have registered for the ifs and um and the forms are there and that's closed registration nobody else can register but as i mentioned you can definitely access those still on um, healthy seminars now um a la carte um so hopefully hopefully that is um helpful and again for the handful of people that have stuck around to the, to the end Thanks for joining us. Um, we have another lecture on Monday um, and a big thank you to Benjamin and Ingrid for um, sponsoring this, you know, um, putting this lecture together and supporting the IFS and um, and offering the services and, their, and the products that they manufacture. So big hats off to them one more time before um, I say adios.